Good evening and welcome to day three of National Consumer Protection Week and Midweek Money Matters. We are so excited to have you here today as we talk about the steps that we need to take if we become a victim of a fraud or a scam. I think this is one of the most important sessions because I'm a firm believer that it's not a matter of if you're going to have a problem, it's a matter of when. And knowing what to do when it happens or knowing how to help someone that you know who comes in to becomes a victim of a fraud or scam can be very helpful in helping that process to be much more smooth. So today we're going to be talking about those five steps. Um, but if you've ever had your identity stolen or you've given some money to somebody that you didn't know who took advantage of you, or maybe you had an unauthorized transaction from one of your accounts. Or worse, maybe someone has opened a new account in your name. Now, throughout today's presentation, I'm gonna tell you about a woman that I met whose sister stole her identity, and that's not all that uncommon. But what she did with that is something that I've never heard before because she took that information and she bought a house. She bought a house. I was flabbergasted when she told me that. And it made me realize just how much of a challenge that would be if that happened to you. So I wanted to really just sort of make everyone understand that if you become a victim of a fraud or a scam, you are certainly not alone. There are lots of places that can help you, that can um, come alongside you to help you get through the process because believe it or not, victims of a financial fraud or scam feel just as victimized as someone who's a victim of a violent crime. And that is statistically proven. So it's important that we know that um, when we become a victim or if we become a victim, we're not alone. And there's lots of places that can help us to get through that. And I just wanted to point out, um, according to the FTC, in um, the last year, so January 1st to December 2nd, so in 11 months of last year, in Pennsylvania alone, there were more than 10,000 reports of COVID-19 and stimulus reported um, frauds and scams. The average person in the United States loses $324. In Pennsylvania, we lost $482 on average. If you ask me, it's way too much money and we need to be aware of exactly what this means to us and how we can put an end to it quickly if we become victims. Now, remember, this was just COVID related. This had nothing to do with all the other scams like the IRS or um, you know, the family member in distress or all the other scams that we talk about all the time. So I think it's important that we understand that. So today we're actually gonna break it down into five easy steps to help you recover in a quick way that is um, going to be relatively easy. And I find for myself, and I don't know about you, but think about when you've got a lot to do, if you make a list, it sort of breaks it down into smaller chunks and makes it easier for us to be able to process and get through that. So I like to think of it like that. So we wanna make sure that we stop the loss by reporting it to the companies that um, are impacted. And then we have to report it to law enforcement. And we'll see in a slide that we actually have to report it to three different levels. Then we need to check our credit. And we'll talk about the importance of keeping a notebook and why it is so critical that we not be embarrassed. Because when we're embarrassed, we don't speak up and the crime continues and continues and continues. And 
what I've learned in my years of working for state government is that if we don't know about a problem, we can't fix it, right? If one of my licensees is not following my rules and no one tells me, I can't fix it. If we've got criminals out there who are stealing money from unsuspecting people and no one tells, there's nothing that law enforcement can do. So it really is critical that we're not embarrassed and that we speak up. Okay, off of that soapbox. Um, so the first thing we wanna do is we wanna stop that loss. We have to notify the institution that's involved, whether it's your bank or credit union, if it's a credit card company. Um, I met an older adult who was, I wanna say she was in her mid eighties and she said, Katrina, someone opened a cell phone account in my name. And she said it took her six months to convince the cell phone provider that it wasn't her account. And they tried to charge her more than $1,500. Now, I'm nowhere near my mid eighties, but it's certainly not in my budget for me to lose that kind of money. So it's important that we understand that. Um, and then if you are, um, if if you're if you're buying something and there's a fraud, you want to make sure that you um, also report it to whomever is making those sales. Particularly, like if someone buys a car in your name, um, you want to make sure that you notify the car company, um, the dealership, because they may not be aware and there may be ongoing problems. So what we need to do when we call them is we need to be prepared to give them as much information about what happened as we can. Um, we need to be able to tell them how we found out about it. Were we checking our monthly statements or did we maybe pull a credit report? And it's critical that they have your accurate credit or your accurate, accurate contact information. Because if your credit report suddenly has a bunch of addresses on it, it's important that the company know how they should get a hold of you. And then you're going to be asked to provide the documentation, which you'll get as you start to file those reports. So remember I said we have to report it. Um, the first thing that we have to do is we have to report it to our local police. If you live in a town that has a local police department, you wanna make sure that you get that report to them. If you live um, in an area that doesn't, I live in Duncannon and we don't have local police. So the state police in Newport is the barracks that I would report to. So we wanna make sure that we report to our local police because they are aware of what's happening in our direct community. But they may not be aware of what's happening in Philadelphia or in Erie, right? So that's why we have to report it to the Pennsylvania Attorney General's office. The Attorney General has jurisdiction over the whole Commonwealth. They're our top law enforcement for the Commonwealth. Um, so we have to make sure that we report the theft to them as well. But that's still not enough. We need to report it at the federal level to the Federal Trade Commission because the Federal Trade Commission sees the whole picture. The Attorney General may see what's happening in PA, but they don't see what's happening in, you know, even our neighboring states, Ohio, um, Maryland, Pitts, um, Pittsburgh, <laughs> Ohio, Maryland, New Jersey, those types of things. Um, so reporting it to the Federal Trade Commission becomes critical. And I'll tell you, another reason that's important is because um, the Federal Trade Commission actually keeps a database and shares information with other federal agencies. So I was at a meeting in Philadelphia a couple of years ago, and there was someone from the Postal Inspection Service there. And they were telling us about a string of identity theft that had been happening in the um, southeastern part of the state in the Philadelphia and um, surrounding areas, but it had also gone into Jersey and Delaware um, and Maryland. So they were investigating the string of thefts. And what was fascinating to me 
is that the string of thefts had taken place five years before. See, it takes sometimes a long time for any law enforcement to be able to detect a trend and be able to um, start that investigation process. And this is where keeping that notebook that we're going to talk about in just a little bit is going to be so critical. Um, so we have to make sure that we report it to all three the, of those um, law enforcement organizations because they all sort of have a different perspective. Now, the third thing that we want to do, and we should be doing this regularly anyway, but if you become a victim of a fraud or a scam, it's important that you pull your credit as soon as you can. Um, you can go to annualcreditreport.com. Um, we're all entitled to pull a free copy once a year from this website. The federal government mandates it. So you can pull from Equifax um, in January, you can pull from Experian in maybe May, and then in October or November, you can pull from TransUnion. The really cool thing is that since we're in the middle of a pandemic, those three reporting bureaus have been, um, have allowed us to be able to check our credit once a week. Now, if you're not heavily impacted by COVID and you're not seeing um, a lot of discrepancies in bank statements or credit card statements, you may not have to do it that often, but knowing that you can goes a long way. So um, make sure that you do that, particularly if you become a victim. Now, when you pull that credit report, it's important that we know what we're looking for. And what are we looking at? I was helping a gentleman from my church who um, had been a victim of identity theft like five or 10 years ago. And um, he was trying to pull his credit report and it wouldn't come through, he couldn't get it. So we wrote to the three credit reporting bureaus and they sent the information here. They had, um, when his, when he had become a victim of identity theft like 20 years before, they never took all of the old addresses away. So his credit report had something like 25 different mailing addresses. And this poor little old man never lived outside of this area. So um, it's important that we look at all of that information. Susan, you're right. So often, we actually not many people realize that we have access to those credit reports every week. Um, it hasn't been heavily advertised, but it certainly is something worth mentioning and sharing with our friends. Another thing that you wanna do when you're looking at your credit report is look at the existing credit limits and balances. If I have a credit card um, that I use for travel only, um, and before pandemic, I was on the road for work between 60 and 80% of the time. So. I had a credit card that was only used for travel. If um, it was compromised and I hadn't realized it, and suddenly someone had called in and said, um, this is Katrina Boyer, I'd like an increase in my credit limit. The If that person had enough information about me, it would be easy for them to increase that limit. And then they could shop on my dime which is what really creates the problem. So we need to make sure that we're aware of that. And then the third thing that we need to look for are accounts that aren't ours. Remember I mentioned that woman whose sister purchased the house without with her credit? Um, if this woman had pulled her credit report like she's legally entitled to do, she would have seen a mortgage on her credit report. And that would have been a really giant red flag. We talked about red flags yesterday. That would have been the biggest red flag of all if you think about um, what that would have told her, especially if she knew where her sister lived because the address to the property would have been listed on that credit report. So it's really important that we check that information. If you find something that's not right, it's important that you report it to each of the three credit reporting bureaus. Um, 
their um, websites and telephone numbers are listed here. I will tell you that when you report it to one person, they'll one one of these reporting bureaus, they're going to tell you that they'll report it to the other two. But the reality is that this is my credit. This is your credit. I take that very seriously. If I see something that's not right, if I have um, if I have evidence that I've been a victim of identity theft, I'm going to report that information to all three credit reporting bureaus because computers don't always communicate the way they're supposed to. Um, those of us who work in offices, I'm sure you all understand um, the frustration that happens when 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 computers don't communicate. So it's important that we make sure that we report each of the three. Now, this is where we start to talk about keeping that notebook. Um, when you start this process, you need to sit down and write out exactly what happened. On, you know, February, whatever, I realized that I stopped getting my credit card statements. So I went online and I realized that my credit card had been compromised. Write down the day and time, write down who you talked to. I called, um, I called ABC Visa and this is who I talked to at this date and time. And this is what we said. And keep those very specific, um, keep that very specific information in your notebook because what happens when someone comes to you in five years and says, hey, you were a victim of identity theft and now we're investigating a whole string of them and we need you to tell us what happened back in 2015. And I don't know about you ladies, but I'm gonna scratch my head and go say what? Because I'm not gonna remember. But if I've kept a notebook, I'm gonna have everything that I need. And not only can I provide that important information to those investigators, but as I start to look through the notebook, it's going to trigger my memory and it's going to help me to remember things that maybe I didn't include in my notebook. As you start to get mail and information about the identity theft or scam, make sure that you put that in the um, notebook as well and then keep it indefinitely because the reality is you never know when you might need that. I had met a couple who said, Katrina, we were victims you know, years before, and we had to prove to a car dealership that we had been victims of identity theft because that information remained on our credit report. And they had to provide proof that they had been victims or they weren't going to be able to get the loan that they needed. So keeping that notebook, not only is it gonna help us in the event that there's an investigation and they're actually able to catch the bad guy, but it can also help us to um, get the credit that we need when we need it. So, you know, as I said um, early on, num step number five is really important. Don't be embarrassed. Um, I have met, I, there was actually, we did a press event a few years ago um, and we had a, I want to say it was a sergeant from the uh, Pennsylvania State Police who actually came on and admitted that he had been in taking his his Christmas Day nap and someone called him and told him that there was trouble with something. And he came very, very close to giving out his Social Security number because he was caught off guard. I have spoken to dozens of people who were attorneys, doctors, lawyers, who had fallen victim to some pretty horrible mortgage scams. Um, so it's really important that we recognize that we're not alone. It is um, a problem that happens everywhere and um, we should never be embarrassed because it doesn't take away our intelligence. It just means that we're human and um, somebody figured out what it took to victimize us. 
um, I'm a firm believer that it's not a matter of, um, you know, the criminal just continuing to to try and try and try. But, you know, the reality is I have a moment in time where I've got, you know, dinner on the stove and I'm trying to do this and I'm trying to do that. And suddenly my phone rings and my reality is I don't answer my phone. But if my phone suddenly rings and I'm busy, I may just answer it just to get that person off the phone. Um, so, you know, again, it's important that we're not embarrassed and that we talk to someone that we trust. Having that person can help us to sort of separate through some of that um, emotional stuff and they can say to us, you know, did you talk to, did you file a police report? Um, they can help us to remember and make sure that we do the things that we need to do in order to recover. So there's a really cool, um, the uh, Federal Trade Commission has um, a fantastic identity theft website. It's at identitytheft.gov. And they actually have sort of the step-by-step -step workbook that you can use. You can download it and print it out. Normally when I'm in the office, I have printed copies that I can mail out. Um, if you ladies would like a copy of that book, if you send me your mailing address, I have to go into the office on Monday to mail out a whole bunch of stuff. If you'd like a copy of it, I'm happy to mail that to you. You can email me your addresses. Um, otherwise, again, it's a it's a really great way to make sure that you cover all of your bases. Um, and again, that's identitytheft.gov. Yes, Susan, um, your mailing address would be great. I can just send it um, from the office when I'm in next week. All right, so I mentioned that you needed to file with three separate law enforcement agencies. If you don't know how to do that, you can go to local police department locator at policelocator.com forward slash PA. If you have a local police department, that's where you will find that listing. If you're like me and you don't have access, then you can go to psp.pa.gov. You type in your um, zip code and it will tell you where your local precinct is. The Pennsylvania Attorney General is at www.attorneygeneral.gov. And um, that's where you would file if you're a victim of a fraud, scam, or identity theft to notify them. And then you go to consumer.ftc.gov to report that you've been a victim of a fraud or scam. Note that it's different than the recovery plan. They have a, a different web address for reporting um, actual fraud scams and identity theft. So you wanna make sure that you have both of those. And I'm happy to email you the slide deck to this event, um, probably tomorrow morning. So we haven't talked at all about the fact that we can freeze our credit. Freezing your credit stops anyone from being able to see your credit information. Um, so it's a great way for you to be able to stop anyone from being able to open credit in your name. But you have to be aware that there are times when we have to have our, um, our credit pulled. For instance, when we have, um, when we're shopping for car insurance or homeowner's insurance, or maybe we're applying for a new job. Sometimes they pull our credit when, you know, depending on the new job that we're taking on. They also may pull your credit when you are trying to um, move, if you're trying to rent a new apartment or you're trying to buy a home. Um, so you can freeze your credit pretty easily. Um, you go to each of these three websites or the telephone numbers and you can create some login information and um, you can freeze your credit that way. To lift it, you just have to um, go in and log in and then you can lift it through the websites. 
Susan, you can also probably call those 888 numbers so that you can um, let them know that you'd like to unfreeze them if you need to. If you don't need to, it's okay to leave the credit freeze in place. Um, since this passed in, I think it passed in 19 or in, in 2019. Um, but what's really great is when you put the freeze, the freeze has to be in place within 24 hours. If you are um, trying to lift the freeze, they actually have to lift that freeze within um, an hour. So, you know, if for instance, you know, you're thinking that you might someday buy a car and then suddenly the car of your dreams is there and you want to make that purchase, um, when you call the credit um, bureau and let them know that you are um, shopping for a loan and you want it lifted, they have to do that again within that, um, within that 60 minutes. As always, our Office of Consumer Services is available to help you during regular business hours. They have no menu options. A real life person is just going to answer your call when you dial 800 PA banks. Those individuals are happy to help you understand what, um, what may be happening with your account, your, your financial institutions, um, if you have a complaint about a company or you have a question about a fraud or scam, those, those ladies are happy to help you with that information. Now, it is Wednesday. Yes, you do have to provide your personally identifiable information. You actually would set up a PIN number for that um, when you freeze, when you want to lift or freeze the, uh, your credit report. So we have two more days left of um, National Consumer Protection Week. And I'm super excited because I can't wait to play Consumer Fraud Bingo. But tomorrow at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m., we're going to be covering basic fraud prevention. So far this week, we've covered the top scams for 2020. We have covered the red flags of scams. Today, we have covered what to do if you become a victim. So tomorrow we're just going to kind of really take a look at what are things that we can do to prevent becoming victims. And then again, on Friday, we're going to play consumer fraud bingo. And I am so excited about that because it's one of my favorite things to do and I don't get to do it very often. So I'm looking forward to that. I hope that you are too. Um, if you haven't already registered, I would encourage you to go on over to our Eventbrite platform and register for that as well. My name is Katrina Boyer. It has absolutely been my pleasure chatting with you this evening. Um, I am going to stop our recording and we will open the floor up to some questions if anyone has any. Stop the recording.